So we'll be looking at Colossians. Uh, here we're only going to look at verses 9 through 11. Uh, I, I really don't like uh, when I do a Bible study and it goes for like an hour. I'm sorry. Well, you guys actually remember what we're talking about. So let's just keep it to three verses. Nice and good, right? Uh, so we, these are the sections we've looked at, the introduction, the theology part, and now we're, we're on the last section of the book, which goes for all of three and four. Uh, and I've just included the ending of the book with the ethics part just to keep it simple. There's no reason to complicate things. Uh, some of these commentaries you read, they just they really need to, you know, take a little breath of fresh air. They've been huffing the 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 breath of their of their offices for too long, I think. Uh, so ethics is basically how to live what you believe. It's a real simple way of saying it. It's your lifestyle focus. So the so the breakdown of of what we've looked at so far in the ethics section. Um, Starting in, in verse 1 of chapter 3, we were looking at thinking holy, and then we went to acting holy last week, verses 5 through 8, and that takes us to, we're going to continue that same that su same subheading of acting holy. Um, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. But Christ is all and in all. So this is another one of those verses uh, that really is taken out of context in Colossians to mean something of a New Age kind of thing, you know. So maybe Christ is in each of us or something, you know, like um, we all have a spark of the divine. Uh, and he's in everything, you know, he's on the, the stage and he's on the trees and he's in us. And, you know, and that's definitely not what's being said at all. So let's let's kind of break this down verse by verse. We'll start out with verse 9. It says, Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its uh, practices. So uh, lying is the last of the list mentioned after wrath and foul language. If you remember last week, he was talking about the, the all the things that sounded very similar, the anger and the wrath and the, you know, all that stuff. And uh, lying is the last in that in that section of things that he says, the, the list of things. So he said he said about foul language, and then after foul language, do not lie to one another. Um, so you can see how he's definitely changing from uh, personal issues that people are going through, like with adultery and stuff, to now we're talking about more interrelational things. How do the church reacts to each other? And uh, if you notice, he's using throughout this kind of section really he, he's using metaphors uh kind of talking about like clothing like when you get dressed do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices this is uh, the same kind of terminology you would use like with clothes you're put off the clothes or you're taking it off and obviously this is something that is a continual process right <laughs> every day you have to get undressed redressed right and that's kind of the idea here it's something that we are continually every day dealing with this so we've put out the put out the old self with its practices but that brings us to the question that we started looking at last week. Then why do Christians still sin? Well, that's because, okay, so let me just kind of say it like this. We still struggle, but we can resist. Okay. As a Christian, we are free from sin, but we do still sin because we are, well, we're still, we're still, we are still born in sin. So even though we've been given a new nature, we've been given the ability to resist um, we do still definitely struggle. And uh, so much as we continue to indulge in sin, we will start going back to that and getting bound in it again. And uh, so it's one of those things that it's hard to know exactly where the line is. You know what I mean? I'll give you another example of where it's hard to know where the line is. Am I saved or am I not saved? Well, I accepted Jesus and I've been I was trying to follow him, but then I just kind of I stopped, and he wasn't really a part of my life. I wasn't reading the Bible, wasn't going to church, didn't seek him, didn't worship, nothing. Am I still a Christian? I don't know, and I don't really know where the line is either. Um, I know that as Christians we grow, but I also know that it's naive to think that we don't have times of shrinking too. So it's one of those things that's a little bit hard to know. Another, another thing is how far is too far where you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit? I'm not real sure. So we have all these questions where, and, and I want you to understand this with these big, hard, difficult questions. You're not going to get an immediate answer first. You're oftentimes not going to get a final answer. And there's just going to be a lot of gray, things that you don't understand. God, did I finally mess up too far where you're done with me? 
See what I mean? And so we have all these questions that don't have answers. And you're going to walk a lot of your life in insecurity and kind of guilt. And there's going to be some parts in your life where you're just not going to have it figured out. And you can either trust God without figuring it out, or you can be really sad about it. Either way, it doesn't change what is. It just kind of changes your outlook on the whole world. So we as Christians, we are still going to sin because we do still have a sin nature. Okay. Um, we are prone to sin. We can resist, but that doesn't mean that we always will. So a good example might be um, one from, I, I brought up the trans um, community last week, and I'd like to kind of build on that because I feel like that's a really good example. Um, trans people are very confused mentally, and uh, they usually have you know trauma that's happened in, the, in their life and that kind of stuff. Um, usually poor relationships with their fathers especially, but some other things too. And uh, so when you look at that, you see confusion. And when you try to talk about what is true, it's not about what's true. It's about what's true for me. So you need to respect and, 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 and accept, you know, my, my trans identity. And I'm not really sure what I am, and that might change in the future, like we saw with Ellen Page. Um, and so we have, there's all these questions. And, and the thing that I want you to get from this is that they are stuck in sin. And I think that this is a great example of seeing what's the differences between being a Christian and not being a Christian. For, for too long, the argument has, has involved being a good person. So I got off drugs by myself, so that means I don't need God. Or, um, well, I was an alcoholic, and then I stopped, so that means I'm not a slave to sin. No, 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 no. See, Trans, that's not the greatest of their sins, and that's not the only of their sins. It's just a very visible representation of a sin that you cannot escape from. It's something where you can't just choose to stop sinning and be okay now. You know, I'm now mentally stable. That's, that's not really a thing that happens. Um, it's more of an expression of it. See, but we as Christians, we're free from sin, but we choose to do it anyways because we like it. We enjoy it. Um, like looking at pornography. Um, I can choose to do it or choose not to, but I really like the way it feels, so I'm going to choose to do it. Whereas somebody who doesn't know Jesus, they don't, they don't have that ability to stand against sin. They can stop a habit, such as doing drugs without, without God. You can absolutely do that. But you're not going to find, you're going to find that it kind of just relocates itself. So maybe before you were saved, maybe you were addicted to drugs, and then you got saved or you just quit drugs, either or, and you find it kind of just attaches itself to some other aspect of your life. So, uh, well, I really thought that we were free from sin as a Christian. Here's the thing. It's a process. It's a journey. It's not something you just wake up and I have arrived. It's something that you are on a, on a journey towards a destination. And uh, I guess if I had to summarize um, what I'm saying here, when do you know that you're a Christian or when you're not a Christian, I think it has more to do about the heart than anything. Your heart has to be in a place of growing and not accepting the sin. See, Christians and non-Christians, they both sin. The difference is really seems to me more an issue of the heart. For a Christian, it's just this, I mean, for a non-Christian, it's just this is part of who I am, right? You just need to accept me for who I am. But for a Christian, it becomes more a thing of, well, I'm, I'm still messing up, but I'm growing and I'm trying. And in time, there's process. So it took me a lot of years to get out of porn. One of the biggest things was I thought I had to be strong enough in and of myself to oppose every single temptation. Well, then I realized I was stupid. And part of it was because I was misunderstanding verses, you know, parts of the Bible like this. So instead, what I started doing is I got accountability, where, you know, people were seeing what I was searching, and also it was blocking what I was searching. And then I was also removing the opportunity. So maybe not being home alone with internet access, a good example right there. Um, and as that happened, I grew stronger, okay? But I think somewhere in the last 2,000 years, we kind of got the idea that opposing sin has to be a solo pursuit. Even though... God told us to confess our sins to one another. He told us to lift each other up, to restore one another. Still, we got this idea somewhere that our sins have to be a private affair. And so I think that what happens is we greatly limit our capacity for success by not being accountable to one another. And I think if you look at, for instance, 
the book of Colossians, you see a lot of us working together and not a whole lot of me doing it by myself. And, uh, well, I think that that kind of, you know, is good enough. So let's go on to verse 10. And I've put on the new self. So remember, we're still on that imagery of, of, of clothing. You've taken off something. Now you're putting something on. This is a new shirt that you're putting on. Uh, you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. Um, surely, if you've read the Bible before, you'll, you'll realize how closely that is to the creation account in Genesis about being made in the image of God. So um, it's not just about taking something off we see here. In the last verse said, you have put off the old self. It's not just about taking off something. I got off of drugs. But also, it's about putting on something, the new self. Uh, and so, okay, I got off drugs and got on what? And got on what? So, here's my life. I have taken something away. There's a hole there now. Okay, what are you putting into the hole? That makes sense? So, in the case of a Christian, it would be God. And that sin no longer becomes life-absorbing. It becomes um, something that you do, not something that you are. Make sense? And so as you're continuing to trust in God and, and, and he's growing you, you move forward. So then he goes on to say, you are being renewed. Um, this is the idea of, um, I'm going to say it in a way that, that's easy for us to understand. Uh, you're learning, you're changing, you're growing over time. You are becoming more spiritually mature. God is making us more like him. You are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of your creator. You, you, are, you, are, you are experiencing a growth process. How, what does that look like? That looks like having problems that you don't know how to get over. That looks like having health issues that you, that you can't get over. That looks like having situations and whatnot arise that you have to deal with. It's something that my dad said that I think I, the other day that I feel like I've heard in other places too. We want the faith to go through the problem, but it's the problem that brings us the faith. And so we have to go through these times to be renewed. You have to go through struggles. You have to let your passion die to get God's passion. You can't live for yourself and expect yourself to be renewed. You have to take off the old self. That means dying to self. I'm not living for myself anymore. It's not about what Michael wants. It's about what is my Lord's command. And that comes where the putting on. So I'm taking off. I'm intentionally dying to myself, and I'm putting on. I'm, I'm intentionally allowing God to change me. This is not something that happens overnight, and it's not something that happens against our will. You know, oh, I want to grow. I want to learn. Okay, go through, go through trials. Go through struggles. Rise above and trust in God. Well, I don't want to have to go through unpleasant experiences. That's how you grow. So this being renewed isn't always a pleasant process. I tell you, one of the things of how I can point to something in my own life where we can talk about being renewed is, so I, I, I used to put a lot of hope in the wrong things. So I'm praying because I have hope that God's going to heal me from this sickness that I don't enjoy. I'm uh, praying so that God makes it where this person that I really like doesn't die. My hope is on the temporary. But God used those answers not being answered to teach me about what true hope is. True hope is the hope of glory, the hope of heaven, the hope of a place where pain is no more, the hope of a place that I might die sick, just like I would have died well. But <laughs> it's not the end of the story. It's just the end of that page. See, that's true hope. So when I pray for healing now, I'm a lot less distraught about whether people get healed like this in the now or eventually. I mean, to me, it doesn't seem as big of a deal because we're all heading that way anyways. I mean, we're not getting out of this alive. It doesn't seem like that big of an issue when we go to heaven, especially when you keep, keep in mind that heaven is better than we can ask or think. You, you got to imagine how, how, how big that is. I know a lot of people who have been miserable their whole life. Why pray for their healing? <laughs> they're going to go see the king of kings. They're going to be happy. It's that we don't want change. It's not anything about God. So that takes us to verses like this. You are being renewed and the knowledge. How does he know that they are being renewed? 
because we're always going through struggles. We're always going through financial difficulties. We're always being opposed. We always got things going on. Even when good things are happening, God is still renewing us through that process of good blessings coming. So now that we know all that, and we know that God is making us more like him. Okay, things don't sound so bad. So that means if you look right here, according to the image of your creator, this is one of those verses that really has a lot of, a lot of meaning to it. We alone of all creation have the capacity to have a relationship with God. This is something the animals don't have. And nowadays, it, it's, it's becoming more and more common to blur the lines between are people special or is life, generally speaking, special? Or is there nothing special to whether something's alive or dead or not? And so you have these different people taking different stakes. And Christians and non-Christians are all over on this one. It's not like anything. But one thing that you continually see in the Bible is that the Bible holds us higher than the animals. It, it says, for instance, numerous times, at least three times in Matthew alone, Jesus says the words, I care for this animal, and yet you are mu worth much more than this animal. Three times in the book of Matthew alone, at least. And there might be a fourth time. I only counted three times so far, but I haven't finished with the book of Matthew yet this, this time around. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and so we see that we are definitely um, special. And one of the things that makes us special is our compa capacity to have a relationship with God. We are moral beings. This is something the animals are not. So my dog, I mean, it can disobey me, right? But it can't like lie. It can't like repent. Uh, it can't show remorse. I mean, it can put his tail behind its, its legs. But I mean, that that's different than than a person saying, you know, I, I messed up. I'm going to try not to do this. You know what I mean? Um, we are made in the image of God. And that's why Paul, why Paul can say you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. You are being conformed, conformed to that image. My dog isn't being conformed to that image. My dog can't accept the gospel. And these are things that a lot for some of us we might say, well, yeah, we know this. But for a lot of other people, it's something that they don't know. Are animals any different? And so the if you take a biblical stance, it's yes, yes, animals and people are drastically different. So God is renewing our mind as our bodies are dying. Now imagine this. And Paul says this in Romans. Um, he, he's saying the same thing here. He just words it differently in Romans. He says that God is renewing our minds even as our bodies are dying. Think about that. So every day we get closer to death. Our bodies get older and feebler and so on and so forth. We have more and more problems. Wake up later, wake up sorer. sorer. Uh, but with, with God, what he's doing is he's remaking us even while our body is, is passing away. And so we are, we are growing in the faith. We're growing in the knowledge of the gospel. We are, we are you know, becoming, hopefully becoming more like Christ um, as we submit to ourselves to him. And so our body, we see nothing, no hope there. I mean, things just, more wrinkles, more pains. Doesn't seem like the best of news. But we know that what's going on in here, well, that's something different. So then verse 11 says this, In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all in and all. Now there's a little bit of, if you saw there, there was a little bit of a play going on there. Greek. Jew, the same as circumcision would have been the Jew, and uncircumcision would have been the Greek. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, the same as in one context, the Greek would have been the slave, and the Jew would have been the free, and in another context, which is kind of a play on words that he's doing, uh, the Greeks would have had, actually been the free ones because they didn't have the law, and the Jews would have been the slaves because they did have the law. Uh, but Christ, and so with all that being said, there is no longer any of that anyways. So uh, um, there, in another part, he says there's no longer ma male and female. And what that means isn't like a transgender God. That's, that's not what's happening. He's talking about the way that we all have equal access to the gospel. This isn't a gospel for men. It's not a gospel for women. It's not a gospel for the Jews. It's the gospel. And that's really the big point that he's trying to make here. In the body, there's no longer whites, natives, Mexicans. Hispanics, whatever. There's nothing. It's Christian. There's no longer this or that. It's Christ is all, and he's in all. So it's one of those things where we have a new identity, and that's really hard, um, especially in racially tense areas. Um, I'm thinking specifically of places like Alabama, uh, where things are just really tense, uh, racially speaking. And there's some of that obviously around here too. I'm, I'm not saying anything about that, but last I checked, we didn't have a bunch of 
you know, rioting and people getting the crap kicked out of them. We haven't really had a whole lot of that here. Um, the racism seems to be a little bit more toned down. You know, we we we, we relocate it just to uh, uh, snide comments and stuff. So, uh, and the idea here that, that Paul's getting at is that we can, we all can experience God's renewal. We are there's not gonna you can't say oh I'm not going to be made in the image of God because I'm nothing but a fill in the blank a handicap a native a woman whatever it is fill in your blank whatever it is that you think might keep you from God's renewal no no there is now no longer that separation it's open for all of us so now let's kind of clarify what that whole Christ thing means he's not saying Christ is all of us. And in everything. And that's actually one of the things that this verse has been said to say there at the end, but Christ is all in and all. People kind of translate that to say, Christ is all of us, so we are all Christ. And um, and Christ is in everything, like this pulpit. Okay, But that, that's actually a New Age belief that unfortunately is getting into the church. And so I just want to kind of clarify what's going on here. Rather, what he's saying is there are a bunch of different people in the church. And there's a bunch of different personalities. Some there, some strong personalities, some weak personalities. That's okay. That's what we're talking about here. That's fine. Uh, especially if you've ever lived next to a, a Jewish population, they know that they, you know, that they have a, they have a different way of dealing with things, huh? Uh, well, anyways, down here there's not that big of a Jewish population, but uh, north there is. Uh, anyways. Uh, the idea here is, is two statements. Let's take them one at a time. Christ is all. What that means is Christ is sovereign. Christ is the head. He's the focus. Christ is all. Okay? It's not my past. It's not my ethnicity. It's not, uh, you know, any of those things. That's not it. What, the unifying factor of all of this is Christ. Christ is all. He's our all. And then the, whole, the second statement he makes is, and in all. Now, what that means is that he's in all the church. We are all equally saved. That's, that's a big idea there. So if we take the statement together, Christ is all and in all. He's the head of all of us, and we are all saved by him. We, have the, we all have the same Christ. Um, this is something that might not seem too big of a deal, but remember that there are actually a lot of, um, a lot of uh, cults out there today that still have a little bit of a problem with this. Uh, Mormonism, for instance, teaches that the blacks are cursed by God and that their less uh, um, earliest forms of, of uh, evolutionary theory teaches that blacks are actually less evolved monkey men uh, and white people are the, uh, the full fulfillment of the evolutionary cycle. So you, you can see how science <laughs> does not have this view Mormonism does not have this view, but Christianity does have this view, that we are all equally saved. We are all equally, um, Christ is in all of us equally. So there's a big difference there between, you know, the Christian view and the worldly view. Um, I know everybody always thinks about how Hitler this and Hitler that, but he wasn't the only one to have these crazy off-the-wall ideas. He was just, you know, the one that everybody can demonize easiest. Uh, so... Christ is all means that Christ is sovereign. Christ in all means ethnicity doesn't matter. So I think that, that kind of clarifies the whole thing pretty well. Uh, so the main point of what we looked at tonight, keep growing closer together as, as a church, keep growing to get closer together by submitting yourself to God's ways. And I think that's, that's a good way to kind of summarize everything that we've looked at tonight. And so how does this apply to us? Well, there's a few things. First off, acting holy doesn't make you holy. It's not about acting a role. Rather, since you are holy, act holy. See, Christ makes us holy, therefore we should think holy. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. And we should excuse me, we should act holy. We looked at that last week and tonight. And we'll continue looking at it next week. Um, so then the next thing is, how do you put off the old self? How do you, how do you put that off? I, well, if you look at the book of Colossians, I, I could give you like a top 10 ways to put off the old self. That wouldn't really help you know about Colossians anymore. So, uh, in in the book of Colossians, the idea of how you put off the old self is to very simple two words: keep growing. That's that's the way that the book of Colossians shows you to put off the old self. You're growing in in the things you believe. You're growing in the things you're thinking about. You're growing in the things that you're doing. 
we see this 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 whole argument that he's making. And if you're not f- familiar with him, what I'm talking about, go back and read Colossians again, and you'll kind of see his his train of thought. Why did he bother correcting what they believed about Jesus? Why did he bother correcting what they what they were thinking about? Why is he correcting what they're with how they're living their lives? How do you put it off? You keep growing. Your beliefs, your thoughts, your actions, your relationships, you're growing. You're growing. And the last thing of how this applies to you, keep an eye on your lifestyle. Just keep an eye. It's like it's like testing te- uh, testing your um, your blood pressure or your heart rate. Just keep a thumb on it and know what's going on in you. Uh, see if you are matching up with the standard of putting it off. Is my life evidence that I'm taking off the old self? Am I seeing evidence in the past week, the past month, the past year? Am I am I putting off the old self? Is there something there that I can look at and say? Yes, I am. Or is there something, nothing there? And I'm thinking, mm, maybe I need to start, you know, focusing back in on God. And I, I do want to say this as someone who's gone through it. If you are, have recently gone through any serious health issues, maybe there's somebody out there that has and I just don't know about it. This is something that I've had, that I personally have had to deal with. You're going to drift from God and that's okay. You just need to get back up on the horse and go again. Okay. Uh, it's one of those things where, uh, it kind of throws off your life. It's hard to concentrate, hard to think. Um, you just get back in there. Well, it's been too long. You know, I'm too far gone. It's going to take too long to, to get back, you know, in that process. I, I got other stuff going on. Just do it. Just start. It doesn't have to be perfect. Try it for, you know, four days a week. That's where you're missing three days. That's not too big, I don't think. I mean, make it a part of your a part of your day day thing. I have a morning routine where I always have to use the restroom and take my pills because of this thing going on. So, and it happens pretty regularly at this one time every single morning. So what I do is I have a Bible that I keep in my bathroom with all my medications. And then when I'm going through the routine, it takes about an hour, I can read the Bible. And it's a way that I know that I'm always doing it. 